Joe Rotel is here, and he's going a little bit batty. So. We're, we're all ready. You know, they're not always scary, right? <laughs> they're actually quite shy and super beneficial, but there's almost 13 of them in North America that are nearly extinct. So 13 different variations of bat that are nearly extinct. There's about 1,400 around the planet. You can help by making a bat house. Okay. So I've got one here. Now this is for education only because it's held together with Velcro. Okay. But one thing to notice how big it is, yeah. they need at least this size. The smaller ones, they won't go in. The roof is tilted and that's just so the rain comes off. Now we'll see how strong the Velcro there is. There it is. There you go. Okay. And this one actually has multiple layers. The front layer, notice the vent. It's about a half inch wide. That's so this top layer is a little cooler than the layer below. Okay. Now this would be the first layer, right? And they would climb here and their little claws hold on to these horizontal lines. There's two holes here about a half inch in diameter so that they can go between the layers. Okay. Because sometimes they get too hot in the layer below and they're like, I want to go underneath. And then there's the back layer. So this is interesting. I always thought that bats scraped into the wood, but I can see you have lots of scratches that you've made, which is for them almost like a yep. ladder. Because, and they're all horizontal, no vertical. Bats are the only mammal who at rest, their claws are tight. We have to squeeze to make them like this. They're like this relaxed. They have to push to release them. So when they're sleeping, they can grab. And as long as your fingernail can feel it, it's deep enough. Okay. And bats are really tiny. This is how big it is. That is really tiny. This will fit 50 to 100 per layer. What? And they come down at the bottom. You need at least three to four inches because they land here and then they crawl up inside. Okay. So we're gonna make these layers. Great, thank you. We, let me move my little guy. So we're gonna start with a cedar fence post. The wood is important. You don't wanna use like pressure treated lumber because that's dangerous for the bats. So we need to cut, we have to have four of these to start with. Three of them we're gonna cut identical, about 26 and a half, 22 and 16 and a half. And all these measurements are on the website. So there's no reason to stress about, okay, what are these measurements? Whenever I cut, I always start with one, and once I get that the way I want it, I use that to measure all the rest. Makes it easy, right? And so you just have to make sure that the first, first one. one, because if you keep doing one after another, they could grow a little bit. I see what you're saying. So you use one to be your constant measuring stick exactly. instead of taking the next one to be the measuring stick, because that's like a game of telephone where it gets distorted. Exactly right. And we want to be safe. Now this, you can see this overhangs quite a bit. So I'm going to extend the t work table just to give me a little bit more support on the outside of this piece. I've connected it to my vacuum. It's gonna suck up all the sawdust. I've already adjusted the blade so it's at least the thickness of the wood. And I've got a guide here. This is a cross cut because we're going against the grain here. So I just have to line it up. Interesting, you don't even turn on the machine until you've gotten everything lined up, and it's that's another safer. safety thing, right? So I'm gonna turn on the vacuum and this at the same time, and we're gonna cu cu cut straight across. Whoa. So we need four of these, and I have those done here, and I'm just gonna leave them here for just a minute. And I did the same for all the other layers, right? So I have the, the sides and we're, we'll get to those in a sec. The next thing we need are all those little tiny pieces that you saw that hold up each layer. Oh yeah. Those little supports. And so that's what's called a rip cut because we're gonna take one board that's 22 inches and we're gonna rip it into little strips. Those strips can be about three quarter of an inch or an inch. I'm gonna use a fence to guide my rip cut and just gauge the size. So and how are you determining with the size of the cut? That's the best thing about this house. As long as everything is done the same, it doesn't matter. Oh, okay. So you just have to make it consistent. Yeah, that's it. So I've got my guide in here. I'm ready to go. And so now let's we're see, gonna a rip cross cut. cut is when you cut cross again. A rip cut is when you like rip a board exactly, apart. Exactly, exactly. So we're gonna turn on the vacuum and off we go. That 
that's it. And we're going to need four of these, right? Two for each layer. The next thing we want to do is all of these boards are slightly different widths. Although the lumber says that it's a one by six, which actually means one by five and a half. Really? Actually three quarters by five and a half. Yeah, when you buy lumber, the size you see is always a little bit larger than the lumber. Although this says five and a half because it's fence, it's like five and three eighths, five and three quarters. The interesting thing for these boards is gonna cost you less than 10 bucks. Wow. So this whole kit's gonna cost you about 10 bucks. That's cool, so, and you can give them to your neighbors and have a whole back yeah, colony. Yeah, there you go. Now we wanna angle, remember we had the roof was at a little angle? Yes. That's five degrees. So I'm actually gonna adjust this blade, and I have to bend down here to kind of see the gauge. So are you actually like twisting the blade to be at an it angle? It is, so if you look, see? Mm -hmm. The other thing you have to be mindful of is when we tilt the blade, we have to make sure it's still high enough, raised enough to go through the lumber. Okay. Because down here, once you tilt it, it could be way too short. Ah, Does that make sense? Yes. So now we're gonna go ahead and cut one of our top pieces, and we're gonna do it at that angle. And this is a rip cut. So I'm gonna use my fence. And I have a little mark, I drew a pencil line on the saw, just so that I know the blade angle is hitting that corner of the wood. Does okay. that make sense? It totally so makes sense. So we're gonna turn it on, turn on our vacuum. That now has a little five degree angle. So Very when we cool. put the roof on, it'll still lay flat against the back. Very cool. We have to cut all the tops at five degrees and all those other boards at five degrees as well. Okay. Makes sense? You know, it strikes me that a paper trimmer is actually very much based on a saw because it has the same idea of like you put your paper up against a guide and you know, the blade goes through and it's so, it's just like a really, really big paper trimmer. You got it. So now we have to get that middle layer and if you remember, our middle layer had a hole in the center, two of them. So to make this hole, I'm gonna use a little jigsaw. I've got some of them done here. So I've got my jigsaw, and I've already gone in from the outside edge and made some relief cuts so that as I go around, they'll drop out of the way. It just okay. makes it easier, but you could go all the way around. You don't need a perfect circle. I use the bottom of a little coffee cup. So now we're gonna cut out our circle. I noticed that obviously you held it off the table so you're not sawing through the table. Right, and it's a little bit rough here, mm -hmm. which I'm okay with and the bats are okay with, but if I really wanna be careful, I've got a little sander I can use as well. This plugs into the vacuum too, um, but there's not gonna be enough dust for us to worry about it. And that just takes off any little burrs. And I noticed, did you just plug in a battery pack to it? Yeah, yeah. So that so makes it easy. So you and it's variable speed, it. so it's so handy um, to just keep on my bench. Cool. So now we're ready to actually assemble everything. Okay. And for assembly... And I assume for the bats, it doesn't need to be perfect circles. That's more aesthetics for us correct. than practicality. They can go in an oval. Correct, correct. And once it's all together, I can still go ahead and hit that with the sander if I want to make it perfect. Now, to glue this, we're going to use something called a bar clamp. I'm going to guess that it's clamps that are attached to a bar. Correct. How did I do with decoding you did. your technical talk? And you know, the tricky, what I think is tricky about these clamps is I needed a piece, say in this case, you know, 16 inches wide. When I bought this clamp, it says 24 inches. And you would think, to me, that means 24 inches between the spaces. That's the whole bar. So the distance here is only 22. Oh, so if you're gonna go buy bar clamps, just be careful that you're getting you know, the size that you really need. Right, because you have to stuff. include the clamp size in that. And what I like to do is just flip these up and put my glue all along it. So how did you become interested in building these bat houses? You know, I love animals. And if you were to look at our house, the front yard is filled with bird feeders and bird houses. <laughs> I mean, you name it, bird baths. And 
I'm just interested in trying to make my yard as much of a natural habitat as I can. And bats, you know, because they're losing their habitat and they're suffering from a disease called white nose disease, it comes from a fungus. And it's not the fungus that kills them. The interesting thing is it's incredibly itchy. So itchy that they'll wake up from hibernation to scratch and then there's no food and they'll oh, no. die. And so you wanna be careful, never go, say in a cave, you think it's cool to go see the bats, but you could be bringing that fungus with you and oh. kill them. So when you make this bat house, we're gonna just clamp this down. Well, and obviously you're gluing and nailing everything together. The example you showed earlier, we used hook and loop tape just because it was temporary right. as an example. And for education. Yeah. So once this is glued, this will only take a few minutes to set, but I'm gonna use what's called a flush saw. I thought that was a knife from your Isn't kitchen. Isn't it cool looking though? And all I need to do is this kind of a motion. They don't have to be straight, you don't have to measure, so that they have those little lines to climb up. Does that make Interesting. sense? Cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the only other thing to really think about here is color. Okay. Color matters. To the bats. If you're in a cooler climate, you can paint it black. If you're in a climate like we are in the Midwest, dark brown or dark gray. Further south, light gray or even a light brown. Why is that? Temperature. If you had it black and you were in Florida, they'd bake, oh. it's a little too hot. And where we hang the house has to be 12 feet at least above the ground mm -hmm. with nothing below it because bats don't fly. Oh, well, I mean, but they soar, don't they? Yeah, and they do fly. They're actually the only flying mammal. We think of flying squirrels. Squirrels don't okay. really fly, they glide. Bats, however, wings are so weak, they can't just kind of flap and take off. Mm -hmm. So that's why we need this four inch piece down here. Bats will drop out of the house, fall, and then they pick up and start to fly. And I remember not only that, but the depth of the wood is important as well. Three quarters of an inch because our little fellow, where'd our little fellow go? They can squish into any little opening. All their bones will flatten except their skull and their skull's about three quarters of an inch, half inch, three quarters of an inch. So we don't want it any open, more open than that, because predators like raccoons mm -hmm. can get in there and scoop them out. So once this is all glued together, how do we proceed? And we've scratched everything in, we just color all the pieces and then assemble it? That's it. Should we look again at, uh, should we assemble the one with the hook and loop tape so people sure, can see how sure. it goes together? I'm gonna just carefully lift this one Go ahead off. and I will bring the other pieces in so that we can, you can show us exactly how we put this all together now. And obviously, you do not live in a baking hot climate because this is pretty dark colored. Right, Ohio. And if you look on the website, we'll have a chart that tells you what to look up your average temperature and what color it should be. So this is the bottom tier. This has what I call their landing pad, right? So they land on this. I've lined up my spacers and the angle matches up here. Then we're gonna put our second tier. And our second tier, notice the boards are also running in the same direction. It's why as long as you cut all these from the same three boards, the width really is gonna work out, right? We've got our little holes for them to go between the layers. Then our top layer is a little bit different. Our top layer, the boards run horizontal. And again, line it up at the top. When you put your bottom board on, we wanna leave a half inch of space. Again, that's that vent to get some cooler air in this top layer. So this is all assembled, and then we have our little roof. Now I use the jigsaw and dog-eared this piece as well. Mm -hmm. This is about 18 and a half inches, just to give it a little overhang, and I was trying to be artsy and That's make great. these styles kind of go and together. And obviously when people do this at home, they will glue and nail everything together so it is nice and strong. I would glue it, I would screw it, and then I would use a mold-resistant silicon to make sure everything's sealed. That's very important. Don't use an acrylic-based caulking because that attracts mold. And remember, mold and fungus is the big disease that's hurting our bats. Good to know. Thank you, Joe. There you go. So now we have a bat house.